Uh, on that note, I think I would like to read from Ice Thong, The Thawing of the Third Reich. <laughs> Revelations. <laughs> Don't be so smug, stricken Bakker, warned Dagmar. Your comeuppance is due. The Aurora Borealis doesn't shine on the same reindeer's ass every night. <laughs> Strickenbacher snickered evilly. When the Fourth Reich has enslaved the world, Fraulein, then we will see whose ass is shined upon. <laughs> His words echoed faintly in the cavernous cargo hold of the ship. Behind him, the dingy yellow fluorescent bulbs glowed behind wire sconces attached to the walls illuminating their immediate surroundings while leaving the stern of the hold in blackness. Somewhere back there were the piles of debris that used to be the scientific instruments before the thawed Nazis had smashed them in an orgy of Stalingrad-esque destruction. At the bow of the hold was a short steel staircase leading, leading to a bulkhead door now shut. Beyond it lay the foredeck and the rest of the Germans, Excuse me. No doubt, shooting innocent seals and birds as they reveled in, survey in surviving 70 years of suspended animation on the Ross ice shelf. A droplet of perspiration trickled down Dagmar's neck and between her glorious Nordic globes. <laughs> Despite being suspended in an iron cage above a tank patrolled by a two-headed shark, she should not be sweating. She should instead be freezing. She recognized the Antarctic chill. She saw her breath misting before her, and yet her lean body and supple limbs pulsed with warmth. The other members of the Swedish women's beach volleyball team <laughs> certainly felt the cold. They huddled together against the wall below, watched over by Germans with machine guns. They all shivered except for Inga, who inexplicably kept rubbing her eyes as if they irritated her. In a cage beside her, Dr. Porfirio also shivered, but most likely from terror. He, his stained lab coat trembled as he stared wide-eyed into the frothing tank below. The chattering of his teeth echoed hollowly in the expanse of the empty ship's hold. Strickenbacher folded his hands behind his back and turned towards Porfirio's comrades the other scientists and crew of the Glacial Explorer that similarly huddled together in their own group, surveyed sneeringly by yet more Nazis with machine guns. Mein Damen und Herren, he began, the new Reich has need of scientists to develop the weapons with which to wipe the scourge of communists and inferior races from the earth. Join us and live. Refuse us and... He nodded to Sergeant Oberstanz, standing beside a panel of ropes and cables that led to each cage. The sergeant jerked at one cable and, after a sickening hesitation, the bottom fell out from under Dr. Porfirio. With an inhuman shriek, he tumbled into the double maw of the slavering Great White. Two sets of powerful jaws clamped and pulled in opposite directions, rending the poor little microbiologist into pieces within seconds, <laughs> until nothing remained but his thick-lensed spectacles bobbing forlornly on the bubbly foam. Sorry? Forlornly on the bloody foam. <laughs> I didn't know this was English. Hmm. <clears throat> Horrified ga- British English people, bloody, never mind. Horrified gasps and sobs emanated from the scholars and volleyball players, but the Germans laughed as uproariously as if they were back in the Nuremberg rallies. After he calmed and wiped the tears from his eyes, Strickenbacher turned to Orstans. I noticed a small delay in the mechanism, Sergeant, he said somewhat critically. The new Reich has little use for imperfection. Oberstanz grumbled something about imperfection, and if you were in heaven, you'd think the clouds were too white. He spoke under his breath, but Strickenbacher evidently overheard, because he quickly retorted, You disgrace our late Führer by questioning a superior officer, and by believing anything can be too white. <laughs> With that, he pivoted smartly on his heel to face the Swedish women. Woman. Women. Woman. Plural. Woman. As for you, my lovelies, yours will be the wombs of the master race. Join us, and the fu fruit of your desirable loins will dominate the world for a thousand years. Not you, of course. He gestured dismissively at Consuela, 
the cocoa-skinned immigrant and assistant coach from Paraguay. <laughs> Paraguay. Brilliant. She had become a Swedish citizen because there were no beaches in her native country. <laughs> Research. Perhaps the fruit of your miscon... Oh, man. Perhaps the fruit of your misogynated loins can do our laundry for a thousand years. Against the vile... Again, the vile Nazis bellowed with mirth. I should use better words. <clears throat> Strickenbacher guffawed so violently that his monocle popped out, dangling from its thin black lanyard on which Dagmar's... Much like Dagmar's hopes. Wow. It's been a while since I wrote that one, folks. It's, uh... Ah, yes, it is in English. Okay. Uh, of course, he continued. But when he could breathe again, if you refuse us, he raised his black-gloved hand to signal Oberstance again. Dagmar squeezed the bars of her cage, her creamy Scandinavian buxomness heaving with each tense breath. Then her brow furrowed slightly. The iron had crimped beneath her hand as easily as if it were paper. With hardly any effort, she pulled the bars apart, just like Superman in those old black-and-white television shows, which she had never seen. <laughs> Quickly, subsuming her astonishment, she poised to leap through the gap just as the cage bottom dropped away. She plunged into the blood-stained water. Even as she righted herself, she saw the double grin of the voracious shark hurtling towards her through the crimson murk gory scraps of lab coat and Dr. Profurio stuck between its teeth. <laughs> Desperate, she struck out, punching the great white in its left jaw. She automatically squeezed her eyes shut as she did so, fully expecting a grotesque gnashing death. But it never came. In fact, upon reopening her eyes, she saw only one dim shadow of the beast drifting down and away, unmoving, as if stunned or unconscious. Not bothering to revel in her relief, she burst to the surface within arm's reach of the tank's edge. Gripping the rim, she hauled herself out with such force that she fairly flew across the cargo hold to within a few steps of her teammates. The nearest German private stared at her stupidly. In fact, they all did. Dagmar didn't blame them. She didn't understand it herself. It seemed that the extreme situation had infused her with Herculean strength. Strickenbacher recovered first. Shoot her, Doomkopf! He screamed. Apparently that was the private's name. Shaking himself to awareness, the private raised his machine gun. Before he could squeeze the trigger, however, Dagmar brought her fist down upon the crown of his helmet with the type of voracious spike move that made her the best outside hitter in international women's volleyball, driving his head squarely into his torso like a nail driven into a board. The pulpy remains of his face stared even more stupidly from the split in his breastbone as he slowly sunk to the floor. The clatter of his dropped machine gun echoed like a panzer fleeing across the desert, deserted Paris streets. <laughs> More research. Uh, in the brief tent silence that followed, Dagmar thought she heard a commotion above them on deck. Strickenbacher shook his fist. Curse you, you Viking goddess, he shrieked. <laughs> to the rest of his men, he bellowed, All of you, shoot her! Dagmar froze, thrilled and appalled at the sudden change to her body, while so acutely aware of the imi imminence of her death. A corporal wheeled toward her, gun at the ready. Suddenly, twin red beams, like focused lasers, struck the gun, and he fairly threw it away, howling in pain and staring at the blisters appearing on his palms. Poor man. On the floor, the gun glowed red, and its wooden stock was charred. Dagmar looked over his shoulder at the shocked Inga. The beams had come from her eyes. I, I don't know how I did that, stuttered the leaf young li libero. Libero? Wow. <laughs> Research. Well, do it again, urged Dagmar, or we'll <coughs> be shot to bits. The radiation, shouted one of the huddled scientists. It's mutated you like the wildlife. 
Of course! <laughs> the world's first atomic engine housed aboard U-3000 had been spewing radiation ever since the U-boat became trapped in the ice 65 years ago. No wonder sharks had two heads and polar bears were bald here. <laughs> the Nazis in suspended animation in their steel berths had been protected as had the crew of the Glacial Explorer in the lab below decks. But the women aboard the wooden quickset had been continually bombarded as soon as they sailed into this bay weeks ago. The Swedes stared at themselves and each other, but no outward evidence was visible in their flawless bodies. The Germans rushed into position, guns at the ready, while the volleyball players fanned out hesitantly, unused to and unsure of, physical conflict. Again, Dagmar heard noise above, a series of taps like muffled boot steps mingled with heavier thuds. Then came louder, sharper reports, first a few and then many. Gunfire. The others heard it too. Everyone glanced up, ears cocked. Was ist das? muttered Strickenbacher. We're under attack, exclaimed Oberstanz. The bulkhead door at the near end of the hold slammed open ringing mournfully like church bells in occupied Poland. Through it stumbled a figure. The face appeared to be that of Corporal, Corporal Burgermeister, but his body, even accounting for the parka he wore, seemed far bulkier, as if something large and black clung to his torso. He staggered forward. Commandant! His voice was thin. Commandant! His voice was thin as he clearly struggled to speak. They are everywhere! He pitched forward and lay still. Forgetting their impending melee, everyone rushed to him. Turn him over, ordered Strickenbacher. Oberstant shoved Burgermeister with his jackboot. The dead German rolled to one side, staring out of sightless eyes, a massive, ragged hole in the center of his chest. Beside him lay a giant penguin, also dead, riddled with bullet holes. Its beak clotted with gore collected as it had impaled the hapless corporal through the heart. No one spoke, because no one could immediately comprehend what they saw. Screams and gunshots diverted them. Through the whole door, Dagmar saw the perpetual dawn of the Antarctic summer, against which milled dozens of silhouettes. She dazedly ran to the others to see more, with the others to see more. The crimson sky was filled with penguins, they swooped and dove, squawking <laughs> angrily all the while. The deck was slimy with blood. Bodies of penguins and Nazis lay everywhere she looked. The three remaining humans... <clears throat> the... <laughs> wow, that was... voluminous. <clears throat> the three remaining humans stood back to back to back as a cloud of murderous fowl swarmed around them, lunging with their deadly beaks. Even as she watched, one German fell, choking on his own blood. Now there were only two. Two out of almost 400 who had survived World War II and decades in suspended animation. Strickenbacher's Nazi face turned even whiter as he watched his dreams of world domination being sent to the gas chamber of penguin fury. <laughs> Gott in Himmel, he breathed. They can fly. <laughs> and that has put an excerpt of Ice Thong, the Thong of the Third Reich.